So, are Christianity, Judaism and Islam aspects of the same faith? This is a question that you may or may not have thought of, but it certainly interested my next guest. Mohammed Amin is originally from Pakistan, but is involved with the Muslim Jewish Forum and spends a lot of time here in Manchester. I'm delighted to say he's with me in the studio. A very good morning to you, sir. Good morning, Mike. Thank you very much indeed for taking the time to be with us. Now, you've written an article on this, uh, so please tell us, do you think all three faiths are the same close what all three faiths are very close because they all worship the same god they recognize many of the same prophets they all respect abraham they all believe that god rescued the israelites from egypt and brought them into israel they don't say exactly the same thing about some aspects of religion but my view is that judaism and islam are very very close when i go to a synagogue I can take part in the service with complete enthusiasm. Yesterday, I was at the Assurance Synagogue in Gatley for their civic service, and it was a wonderful occasion. When I go to church, I can sing along with the hymns, but at times I have to sort of bite my tongue and keep quiet because I do not accept that Jesus was the Son of God or that he was divine. I believe he was a human being, even though he had a virgin birth. Now... uh, (sighs) What inspired you to write about this? Because this isn't something you hear being discussed an awful lot, in my opinion. Well, I decided to write about it because, to me, it's always been self-evident that Judaism and Islam are very close religions and that Christianity is a little bit away. And I was having lunch with a very senior Anglican cleric who I'm not going to name, and I was really surprised when he said to me that he thought Christianity and Judaism were very close and that it was Islam that was the far away one. And that was so contrary to everything that I understood that I felt I needed to do write about it and I needed to have some research and to lay out my arguments logically, which I now, did. I have, to, I have to admit, this is something that I've thought of over the years. And the reason I come from a totally different point of view as to why I think they're close. And my view was... How is it possible that three such huge religions could all start off in a very small area on this earth? They're all from a very small area, geographically. And that's what led me to believe maybe, just maybe, they're linked. In my view, they're completely linked because God chose to speak to man and God chose to speak to man in a particular part of the world. Uh, Abraham came from Ur of the Chaldees in Iraq. God spoke to him there. God led him into the land of Canaan, and he promised this land to Abraham and his descendants, his children Isaac and Ishmael. God rescued the Israelites from Egypt. It's all a very small part of the world. And I don't know why God made those choices. That's up to him, but I believe very firmly that he did. Well, you say it's up to him, but why, in your opinion... Would he invent, for want of a better word, three different religions? Why not one? God only has one religion that he's taught mankind. The variations come from human beings gradually deviating. And if you study the early history of Christianity, by about 300 AD, when Christianity became the official religion of the Roman Empire, it was a very different religion, in my view, from what Jesus and his disciples actually believed. Jesus was a practicing Jew. So many Christians forget that. Jesus kept kosher food. So many Christians forget that. In my view, Christianity changed over the centuries because of its interaction with pagan Rome. It was very successful for Christianity becoming the official state religion, but once you get into bed with the state, actually you've sold your principles. Why do you think there are so many problems between the faiths? The problems come when people try to impose their religious views on other people. I don't believe that I'm responsible for the salvation of anybody apart from myself. I need to live my life in a way that God wants, and hopefully I will go to heaven, but I do not regard myself as responsible for your salvation If I have a polite conversation with you sometimes, I'm doing more than my duty, but your salvation is between you and God. Where we go wrong is if I regard it as my responsibility to save your soul by stopping you from doing certain things, and that's when you get religious problems. 
But there's also, as well as problems, there's <laughs> also the violence which one cannot ignore. <laughs> and people are going around and <clears throat> doing their violence in the name of their religion. Yes, but this violence comes from those people who believe that they have some kind of responsibility to prevent other people doing irreligious things. As far as I'm concerned, if somebody wants to be gay, that is a matter between them and God. There are other people in the world uh, who believe that actually if somebody is gay, they should be punished. There are Muslims who believe that. There are Christians who believe that. There are Jews, I think, who believe that. And that, in my view, is the wrong approach. I believe it's, it, where we go wrong is when we try to stop other people doing things that are sinful. You used a very interesting word there. Might I please pull you up on it? Yes. Irreligious. What does irreligious mean? Uh, irreligious people are people who simply don't have a religious belief. Uh, but my concern is where religious people are trying to stop other people doing things. That's where we go wrong. That's what I wanted clearing up. Now, tell me a little bit about yourself and your history, because as I mentioned in the introduction, you're originally from Pakistan, yep. a country at the moment with huge problems. Yes. How were you able to leave that country and come to live in the UK? My father came here for the first time in 1933 when it was, India was part of the British Empire. My mother stayed in India at that time. After partition, my, my father went back to Pakistan, found my mother in refugee camps and her family. He stayed in Pakistan for a few years, but actually came back here. I was born shortly after he'd come back. And two years later, after my sister died, my father said to my mother, come over and bring our son with us, with you. So I came here when I was about two years old. I've lived here ever since, always in Manchester. And what do you think of Pakistan as you look from these thousands of miles away of what has become of your country? I think it's an extremely sad case, and it shows what happens if people put religion before everything else. As far as I'm concerned, with hindsight, I don't believe that Pakistan should ever have existed. We have been Indians as people for 4,000 years since the first Indo-Europeans came over the Himalayas into India and found this wonderful country and this enormous river. The river was so big, the only name they gave it was the river, and they called the whole country the land of the river, because the river is the Indus, which means river in that language, and India is just the land of the river. And we have been Indians with different religions over the thousands of years, but authentically Indians. When you decide to split off and have a separate country just because you want a country where everybody follows your religion, that's where things go wrong. And people only do that because they then want to have laws which are religiously based to force other people to, do, to not do sinful things as they see them. And as a bit of a history lesson for me as much for anybody yeah. else, who took the decision <clears throat> for partitioning? Who, who made the decision? There was a gradual development of a grassroots movement amongst Muslims wanting to separate from the majority Hindu population of India. Now, it didn't, separation didn't take place everywhere. There's an enormous Muslim population inside India. In fact, I think India has more Muslims than Pakistan does. But it was uh, something that it grew gradually during the struggle against uh, British imperialism. But in my view, it was a mistake. And what was life like for you growing up in the UK? It was very strange because there were only a handful of, pa of families of Pakistani origin in Manchester at that time. So myself and one other person were the only Pakistani origin children in our primary school. When I went to secondary school, I think I was the only Pakistani origin person out of about 150 in my year at grammar school. So you were growing up as part of a very small minority. The other thing which was strange was growing up with no relatives because... Our family consisted of me and my parents, and after I was six years old, I had a sister, but it was a very tiny nuclear family because all my cousins, my uncles, my aunties, etc., they were all far away in Pakistan, and in those days, there was no easy communication. We didn't have cheap air travel. So you grew up in a very isolated kind of way, and I grew up bridging the two cultures. On the one hand, I fully absorbed British history, British culture, the English language, but I also knew that I had a, a Pakistani culture 
and I had a different religion, which was Islam. And this is this is a terrible question. I hold my hands up. Um, would you have wanted to have been brought up in Pakistan? Uh, first of all, Pakistan, our family was very poor. If I stayed in Pakistan, I would never have gone to school. I would probably have ended up as an illiterate peasant farmer. As it was in this country, I went to a grammar school. I went to Cambridge University. I became a partner in the world's leading international accounting firm. So I've had a much better life through growing up in this country than in Pakistan. So in that sense, it's no contest for me. My very special guest today is Mohammed Amin. We'll be